Well, um, I should let everybody know I got interested in magic when I was six years old. That was um, a long time ago, 62 years ago. So I've been interested in magic for a long time. And uh, for a while, when I was growing up, I lived in the state of Indiana, which is in the Midwest in the United States. And there was a magic shop in the town that I grew up in, a city called Fort Wayne, with a really great magic dealer, a fellow by the name of Dick Stoner. And Dick Stoner was really great because uh, he never sold me anything that was too advanced for my age. So I never got frustrated as I was learning magic. And uh, in a few years after that, we moved away from that town and I ordered a lot of stuff from Dick Stoner. And what I mainly ordered was books. And the reason I ordered books was that it seemed to me you got more for your dollar when you bought a book. You could buy a trick for $15 and you'd have one trick or you could buy a book for $15 and have 60 tricks. So that always seemed like a better choice. So I got very interested in card magic and sleight of hand magic. Uh, I'm also a piano player. I, my degrees are in music. And um, so I had a little bit of digital dexterity from playing the piano. So sleight of hand seemed to come a little bit easier for me. So what happened was that, uh, you know, there, I'm sure this happens for everyone uh, as they develop in magic, when you first get started and you read tricks, you think to yourself, how in the world could anybody have come up with this trick? How in the world are magic tricks invented? And what happens is, is the more you study and the more you read, you begin to understand how certain slights, certain moves, certain gimmicks accomplish things. And then you begin to understand the structure for these tricks. Now, for me, uh, I was very interested in coming up with my own tricks, mainly just to be different from the other magicians around me so that I had a repertoire of material that was unique to me. So I never really thought about publishing tricks that I came up with. They were specifically designed to be tricks that I would use in my work. Uh, I was really lucky in uh, the early 1970s, around 1972, I met a bunch of guys in Lafayette, Indiana. This is where Purdue University is. And we started a magic club up there, and very creative guys. Uh, Tom Gagnon, who some of uh, your uh, members may know as uh, not only a great creative magician, but a wonderful illustrator of magic books. He illustrated the Vernon Chronicles books. Uh, he was part of that group. And part of the fun we had in that group was somebody would do a trick at a meeting and then the next month we'd try to fool that guy with the same trick that he'd done. So it was this really great back and forth of trying to be creative and trying to come up with methods that would fool each other. And uh, also around that time, I met Harry Reiser, who I will talk about a little bit more later on. And uh, Harry is, was not a professional, but uh, a, a very enthusiastic uh, amateur magician, hobbyist, and a very clever guy. So as I met with him and began to see how he constructed his tricks, I began to get a feel for how to do mine. Now to address the question about how the workers book started, um, I was working at a place called Illusions, which was a magic themed restaurant uh, in 1988. And I previously worked for uh, six or eight years at a restaurant called Max and Irma's. So I had a body of material that I had come up with uh, during that time. And in particular, I had a trick of mine called the pothole trick, which has become pretty well known uh, around the world. And what I was worried about was that one day I would open up a magic magazine or a magic book and there would be my trick. Somebody would have seen it, figured it out and published it. So in 1990, I published my first book, which was called Workers One had four routines in it. And that was really the start. It was basically self-defense. I think if I wasn't in a situation where I had to encounter any magicians, maybe all that material would never have been published. But it started out as being a, a self-defense mechanism. And then, of course, once you start publishing books and they get distributed by magic dealers around the world, then all of a sudden, uh, magic clubs start saying, oh, will you lecture for us? Will you talk about your stuff? 
I, I was actually hired for my first magic convention to perform in 1976. Uh, but I never lectured at any of the conventions I was uh, hired to work. I was just hired as a close-up performer. Um, but then once the workers' books came out, then people wanted to see me lecture. And that's when that started. And, and you know, thanks to the workers' series, I've been around the world. I've talked to wonderful magicians. I've spent uh, uh, some wonderful days doing a convention in Germany some years ago. Uh, I have good friends from all around the world now. Uh, and um, so that was really a great benefit. It's, uh, I remember sitting uh, in a cafe uh, with Max Maven in Paris or, or Lyon, one of those places. And, and we just said to ourselves, it was so beautiful and so peaceful. We just had a glass of wine and we thought to ourselves, look what magic has provided us. Look what magic has allowed us to be able to do. And it's, it's been really great and I'm grateful for that. Well, when I was growing up, uh, I had a couple of influences. Uh, one was uh, the fellow who owned the magic shop, uh, Dick Stoner. And Dick Stoner was great because he was really funny. And uh, I grew up with a funny family. I have funny relatives uh, and uh, sort of developed a sense of humor that way. So I've always been drawn to the people who could do the things I like to do, which would be either magic tricks or playing the piano, and could be funny while they did it. So for piano players, for me, I loved Victor Borga. And I, I love Pete Barbuti, who was very funny piano player. People like that, Steve Allen, who was an old uh, talk show host who played the piano. And with magic, I liked magicians who could make people laugh. And Dick Stoner was great at that. So he was a big influence in terms of adding the entertainment value to the magic tricks that I did. And he was a, a huge influence. He just turned 91 uh, back a few weeks ago. So uh, he's, he's a great guy, big influence. And then my other big influence was uh, Harry Reiser, who I mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, and what I learned from Harry was uh, uh, Harry's mentors, the people that Harry hung out with specifically were Di Vernon, the professor, Charlie Miller, and a fellow, some people won't know, but a fellow named Stuart Judah, who was a uh, magician from Cincinnati, Ohio, very good amateur magician. And so through Harry, uh, the Vernon approach to magic got instilled in me. And the one thing I sort of say about it is when you watch Harry do magic, at the end of the trick, all you could think was, but he didn't do anything. So there was nothing in the performance, nothing in the handling, nothing that gave you any clues to how the trick worked. So consequently, all that was left is just pure astonishment. And I thought, this is the way I want to do magic tricks. This is what I want my magic to look like. I want people not to say, oh, he's fast with his hands, or oh, look how cleverly he shuffled the deck. I want him to say, I don't think a human being can do that. And that's really what I learned from Harry Reiser. And, and so through him, the lessons of Vernon and Charlie Miller and Stuart Judah were imparted to me. Now, this wasn't, I don't want people to think that these were formal lessons. I would just go over to Harry's house. He lived not very far away from me while I was going to music school uh, in Indianapolis. And we'd just hang out and we'd talk about tricks. At, at the beginning, mostly Harry talked and I listened. And then later on, I would come in with things that I was working on and um, Harry would tear them apart and we'd try to put them back together and try to fix them. And, and sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes the reality of it was just, you know, Harry would say, ah, that's really no good, Mike. And I go, well, okay. And then I'd move on to something else. But that's a big, big part of uh, growing in magic is understanding that sometimes you're going to run into a dead end and the thing you're trying to, to fix and create, it isn't going to work out the way you want to. So maybe you just put it on the back burner, as we say in English, and you move on to something else. Um, so Harry was a very big influence. Uh, also through Harry and uh, through my association in magic, I've been able to meet and be friends with uh, really the, the best magicians in the world. So um, 
I, uh, I met Johnny Thompson through Harry Reiser. Johnny and I met in 1976 at Harry's house, uh, 76 or 78, somewhere around there. So we've been friends for a long time. And again, with Johnny, Johnny was an interesting case because um, Harry was maybe five years older than Johnny. Uh, and they both lived in Chicago for a long time. And really, Harry was Johnny Thompson's mentor, even though he was only a few years older than Johnny up in Chicago. So uh, Harry imparted a great deal of the same kind of information I was getting from him some years later uh, to Johnny. And then, of course, Johnny had the benefit of living out in California. And, uh, you know, Charlie Miller lived with Johnny Thompson for a number of years. So he had that influence and also the Magic Castle and Vernon was there. So uh, I've just been real lucky to have uh, made the acquaintance of people who sort of look at magic the, the way I look at it. And I'm inspired by them and, uh, you know, love working through their material. So I've been uh, I've been lucky that way. Trying to come up with a new effect or a new idea, it's almost a game. Uh, who was it? Uh, one of the psychologists, somebody like, uh, it's not Freud, I have the wrong guy, but somebody said that, that the creative mind plays with the things it loves. So there has to be a sense of play to the whole creative idea. Um, I find the easiest way to be creative, first of all, is to fill my head up with all sorts of stuff. And I have found over the years that the best way to do that is to read. Uh, because when I read, I'm seeing the trick and it's not filtered through anybody else's performance. So I get to sort of view an ideal form of the trick, even though there may be patter or things like that that the person's included. When I read it, it's in its most stark, pure form, and those ideas can flow in. And I like to read an awful lot of stuff. Uh, I read and read and read. I, sadly, I, I don't read as much as I used to, but when I was a kid, boy, did I read. I read everything. And then every now and then, something may happen. You'll, you'll hit a trick and you'll go, oh, wow. Well, that's really fun. That's a really fun trick. And it may be a couple of things about it. Maybe it has a cool move in it that makes the thing work. Or maybe maybe the pattern that goes with it is really fun. Um, that kind of thing. And, and so then I'll start to play with it. Now, there's an aspect to trying to create or to fix a trick. It's really important. And it, for example, if you're going to carve the statue of an elephant out of a big block of marble, you have to have an idea what that elephant's going to look like before you start knocking away and chiseling away. You have to have a clear idea of it in your head first. And I think this is what a lot of magicians don't have when they start to create. Uh, I have a very clear idea of what I want a trick to look like. And I want it to look like such that when people see it, they'll go, but he didn't do anything. So right away, if I'm gonna work on a trick, let's say I find a trick and it fits me really pretty well, I like the pattern. An example of this is my friend, uh, Dan Garrett from Atlanta, Georgia, came up with a trick called four card reiteration. And it's sort of like a six card repeat trick, but you do it with four cards. And it has really funny, uh, had funny patter and a funny uh, kicker at the end, a funny surprise kicker. But right at the beginning of the trick, there was a thing that I didn't like, which was you start off with four cards and you have to add three cards to it. And Dan does this by getting a break under three on top of the deck and then adding them on this way before you put the deck away. Well, I hate that. I really hate that. And I hate it because once the cards are off the deck, there's no reason to bring them back to the deck. So see, right away, that's a spot I would look at and go, oh, if I want to do this trick, I need to fix that. And uh, the way I fixed it, I published this trick. It's in, uh, it's in my ebook, Closely Guarded Secrets. The trick is called uh, the trick that Lance Burton showed me. And the way I fixed it is instead of using this add-on off the top of the deck, I do a palm, a gambler's copper, a, a bottom palm of three cards 
the spectators counting the ones she has, and then I add them on that way. So the deck is gone. And you see, once the deck is out of play, the trick becomes very clean. And they, there's nothing to look at that makes you the tiniest bit suspicious. So technically, these are the kinds of things that I look for as I, as I work on ideas. Uh, this, of course, means that I'm basically taking somebody else's creation and molding it to fit the parameters that I um, put up for the tricks I like to do. Sometimes I come up with tricks that have, that have never existed in magic before. So for example, excuse me, for example, uh, the Frog Prince is a good example of this because certainly there have been card transpositions in magic before, but there's never been a transposition between a normal card and a folded up frog card. And of, that, of course, didn't come from my saying, I want to do a goofy card transposition. That came from my saying, I want to do the story of the frog prince, the story of the prince turned into a frog who turns back into a prince due to the kiss of the princess. So the whole inspiration from that was not magical. It was from this outside story source. Um, I have a trick in uh, my ebook, uh, The Paradigm Shift, Volume Two. It's one of my favorite things I've ever come up with. And it's called uh, uh, You Bet Your Life. And that trick, there's no trick like it in magic. It has a plot that is different from anything you've ever seen in magic and a method that completely plays with your brain. It's a really fun trick. I don't want to say any more about it because I don't want to spoil it for anybody if they've never seen it. But my point about it is, it didn't come from magic. It came from outside of magic, from a puzzle, actually. I was listening to a radio show, and the guys on the radio show told this puzzle. And the puzzle was so baffling to me that I couldn't figure out how it could be solved. And so uh, they were running a series of this radio program. I sat in my car for 45 minutes until the show came around to the next episode so I could hear the answer to the puzzle. And, and as soon as I heard the answer to the puzzle, I said, oh, that's a magic trick. That's a magic trick. And boom, just like that, the idea fell in place and I knew what I needed to do. Now, this is a very long way of saying that the process goes on and on. And you're, you're really always thinking about these things because sometimes the ideas will come to you quickly. Sometimes the ideas will take years. Sometimes after all those years, you still won't find the right answer. So uh, my suggestions are have in your head a very good idea of what your magic is supposed to look like. Two, fill your head with all kinds of ideas and information. And three, go outside of magic to find plots and ideas that you can use to create things uh, in your magic. And, and then stick with it, stick with it. Um, I moved to Las Vegas. I, I first met Penn and Teller, oh, in the mid eighties, I guess. And we knew each other as acquaintances. Um, but then our paths would cross and we got to be more friendly. And I moved to Las Vegas in 1998. And at that time, Johnny Thompson was in, in Las Vegas as well. And Johnny suggested to Penn and Teller that I join their team of people working on material for the Penn and Teller stage show, which I did. I did that, uh, the, I guess I lived in Vegas about 12 years and the whole 12 years I was there, I did that. I was responsible uh, for things like um, the phone in the fish, I helped design that. I designed, helped design the TSA trick, um, just all kinds of stuff. I worked on lots and lots of things with Penn and Teller. And then I moved away from uh, Las Vegas and eventually ended up moving with my wife and daughter to Canada. My wife is Canadian. So uh, the first season of Fool Us was produced in uh, the UK and I had nothing to do with that. Johnny Thompson, and a fellow named Paul Stone were the magic advisors for that. That series was canceled in Britain, but a network called the CW Network picked it up in the United States and started to show episode 
or season one and it got good ratings. So they bought more seasons of it. So when we started on season two, uh, it was filmed in Las Vegas at the Penn and Teller Theater. And Johnny Thompson suggested that uh, to the producers of the show that I would be a good person to bring on to work on the show. So it was really due to Johnny Thompson that I got hired for the show. And of course, Penn and Teller were enthusiastic about my joining as well. So uh, I have been with the show uh, from season two. And right now, even as we speak, I'm working on season eight uh, on, the, on the show. So I'm doing all my work uh, that way. Um, so that's basically how I got into it. Um, the, the show itself uh, is, has been an interesting process and has developed over the years. And we've smoothed out a lot of things. Uh, so for me, the process has become um, a little easier. Last season, the season that has just aired on the CW was shot in October of last year and we had to shoot it under COVID protocols. Uh, which was a huge challenge for everyone. As a matter of fact, I was unable to travel from uh, Canada to the U.S. for that shoot, so I did all my work remotely. I had a little console that hooked up with the truck, the production truck in Las Vegas, and had my headphones, and I could talk to Penn and Teller and do the whole thing. So that was a real challenge. Um, then when, uh, very sadly, uh, when Johnny Thompson died, he actually collapsed on the uh, first full day of uh, work on uh, two seasons ago. And uh, I guess it was in 2019, I guess, that he died. Uh, so I had to do that whole two weeks by myself. And then um, it's, a, you know, it's one of those things, Johnny and I worked so well together because we had the same mentors, because we have the same influence, Harry Reiser and Vernon and Charlie Miller. So there was very rarely any conflict uh, between Johnny and me as we talked about things. We generally agreed on how the magic should look. So it was easy to work together. Um, when Johnny died, uh, it just seemed to me that it would be easier for me to do it by myself rather than to try to train someone to understand my way of thinking and, and how I, uh, because there's more to just magic that's going on here. You're not just a magic problem solver, although that's a big part of my job. You also have to be uh, like a coach. You have to make sure you have to keep people pumped up and calm down and relaxed and get them to understand how they have to, you know, there, there's a lot of stress in a Fula shoot. And so you need to make people understand that they need to, you know, be open to the suggestions coming in and, you know, not to get freaked out by them. So there's an awful lot more than just being the magic guy. Um, there's also a, uh, because it's such a high pressure situation, you have to be somebody who doesn't blow their top. I mean, uh, you know, we record uh, in a normal shoot pre-COVID in a, in a less than two week period, we record 62 magicians and 13 pen and teller routines. That is a lot of recording. And yet, in the eight years, eight seasons that I've worked on the show, I have, there's only been maybe two times when the pressure of the thing, somebody blew up. And then, of course, calm down, kiss, make up, everybody's fine. But, you know, you would think under that situation, people would be exploding left and right. So it's, that's really a part of it is to be able to take in the pressure, eliminate it however you can, and then move on. And and I'll tell you, I'm really, you know, I'm very proud of the show uh, for several reasons. I think it represents magic in the best way of any TV show, maybe of the last 20 years. There's been nothing that's done such good for magicians as Fool Us has in terms of showing them as human beings, in terms of not cheating when we do the magic, that it actually is the way it happens on the stage. There's no, we never edit for deception. We will edit for time, but nothing that we cut out keeps you from knowing how the trick might work. And um, and it's an intelligent show. So I'm really, uh, really proud to be part of it. And, you know, I, I shepherd uh, 62 magicians every year through the process and, in, and have been able to meet some wonderful, wonderful performers, people I wouldn't have had a chance to encounter. So 
Uh, I'm happy to be part of the show. I think it's great. The biggest difference is this, that little rectangle that you've drawn around my picture. Once the camera draws that rectangle around you, it eliminates an, a lot of what magicians spend their lives learning to do. Because with this rectangle, there is no misdirection. And the reason that there's no misdirection is everything that's in that rectangle is of equal importance. If you think about how misdirection works, if I'm standing at a table and everybody's seated, and I direct a comment to this person, well, everybody looks and I'm in the shadows now, if you think about it. I'm, I'm no longer in the spotlight. The spotlight has shifted here. So if I need to do something sneaky, I can. Sometimes if I'm looking at, at a deck and I look up, your eyes follow my eyes and the shadow is down here and I can do a pass or a move or whatever it is I need to do. But on television, that doesn't happen because everything is captured in the same frame. So if I look at this guy, well, you can still see me just as easy as you see him and that misdirection disappears. No, so for Fool Us, this is a really big challenge uh, in terms of sometimes fixing some of the techniques that may be involved in somebody's act because they may be doing something that in real life you would never see. But on television, you can't hide it. It becomes obvious. Uh, an example of that is a friend of mine, an old friend of mine, was working on a routine to submit to Fool Us. And it involved a, a shirt where between two of the buttons, there's like a little top. It's almost like a top. It. It's a place where you can, you can hide things in there and steal them back out again. Well, when you're standing up in front of real people, you can lean in and, and that that ditching and retrieving uh, doesn't look horrible. It, you can get away with it, but on television, it looks exactly like what it is, that you're shoving something in your shirt and you're taking something out of your shirt because you can't misdirect away from it. So that's one of the, the biggest things uh, for me. That is really the biggest, the biggest problem about performing on TV. Uh, the other thing that's a problem is just connecting with your spectators. I mean, I really like to be, to feel like when I'm working for people that we are in the middle of a shared experience and I'm not the focus of attention. The magic is the focus of attention. I'm just the conveyor, the person that lets that happen. But I'm more interested in us than I am in me. But it's really difficult to do that on television. It's so hard to get that kind of um, empathy and that kind of interaction. So those are the really big challenges. The, for me, the biggest is, is just that misdirection disappears. Um, and also, you know, it's, we were just, I was just talking about this on Facebook uh, with uh, Steve Spill. And Spill was talking about Albert Goshman, the wonderful, wonderful Albert Goshman. And, you had to see Albert's act live. You had to be in that moment watching him. Seeing him one degree of separation away out on a TV screen was not nearly the same. And the same goes for the things like bar magicians. You know, there's some video of, of he Bahaba Al, the great Chicago bar magician. And um, he's one of the greatest magicians I've ever seen, one of the funniest performers I've ever seen. But you wouldn't know that if you only saw him on the videos that exist with him, because they just don't do him justice. So it, television is a major challenge for, uh, unless you're designing magic specifically for television, then, you know, you know if, you're a, if you're a guy, you know, like stage magic, that works pretty well on TV because there's a separation between you and the audience normally, so you don't lose that. But I, I guess my point is talking about close-up magician specifically. It's a much more difficult time. So I guess that's what I would say about that. I'm going to sound like an old guy. And that's just the way it is, I guess. 
Uh, my first suggestion would be to read as much as you can. I know, you know, everybody's down on reading. Oh, it's an old guy wants me to read. But I have the best magicians. And I, like I say, in the last 60 years, I've been fortunate to know many of the best in the world. All of them read. All of them read extensively. Uh, video is not their primary way of learning material. They read. And the reason for that is, if you think about it, magic is, it's part entertainment, but it's part intellectual. And the intellectual part is, I'm trying to fool you with something that you should be able to figure out. So it's my intellect against your intellect, more or less. Well, reading is an intellectual pastime. Watching is not an intellectual pastime. So if it's hard for you to, to, you know, read a book, trust me, you know, when I say that I read a lot, people think that I was, I have born with genes, you know, that made it easy for me to read, but it's not the case. Uh, I was surrounded by books when I was a kid. My parents loved books. Uh, and because I was isolated, I didn't have other magicians or magic shops nearby. That was my source of knowledge. You got to remember, this was way before videotape. Books were really, books and magazines were the only way to learn. So, you know, give it a try. Uh, in particular, go back to the old books. Go back to Greater Magic. Go back to Tarbell. Go back to the old magazines, the Jinx and the Phoenix, uh, Paul Bearer's Review. There's wonderful magic in there that has been forgotten. So if you're looking to do something new, there's a lot of really fun stuff in there. The second thing I would suggest is if you can, find a mentor. Find somebody who's older than you and better than you, whose magic style you like, that maybe you can talk to, you can ask questions of. Um, and sometimes that's easy to do, sometimes that's not easy to do. Uh, Sometimes the way to do that, you're going to have to pay for lessons, pay for sessions. But if you think about it, what you're going to get out of that, because it's directed specifically toward the things that you're trying to figure out, will be a much bigger help to you. And along those same lines, my third one would be, don't be afraid to talk to the old guys. When I was young, and I no longer am, but when I was young, I specifically wanted to talk to the guys who were older than me. Partly because back in the, the 60s and the 70s, and even almost up into the 80s, magic secrets were still pretty hard to come by. And if you wanted to get some, you had to talk to the guys who knew those secrets, and those guys were older than you were. So uh, it's important to talk to the old guys. Now, uh, sometimes people are very shy about that. Well, I wouldn't even know how to go up and talk to you. Know, oh, he's Joe Blow. I mean, he's published this and that. How do I talk to him? Well, what you do is you find a good question, and particularly if it relates to their material. So if somebody comes up to me and says, you know, Mike, I've, you know, you've got this double lift from the middle I've heard about, and I don't quite get how that works. I'll go, okay, he knows a little bit about my stuff. He has a specific question, let's talk. And now you've got your way in. But if you just walk up to somebody and say, hey, show me this, I hear, show me your second deal. Show me your bottom view. You're going to get nowhere. You're going to get nowhere with that. Because it doesn't feel like there's any kind of, you know, you, you, the question the old guy asks is, what's in it for me? There's nothing in it for me, you know. But if you see that there's a definite purpose. So don't be afraid of that. It's, it's really a good thing. Um, and that's, uh, I guess that would be my main thing. Um, if you follow those three things, I think you'll, you'll be well on your way to, moving at least in a direction that not many other people are moving in. So if that helps. Wonderful. Thank you. This was great.